-hmm. A lot of people are doing nothing more than getting huge, huge quantities of mass and see if they can get a, a gravity wave to cause things to move. Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't what, what we're talking about at all. Mm -hmm. So I uh, wondered if gravity could be uh, related to its cousin magnetism. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I found that when I take two magnets together, I have some neodymiums around here that I'm actually afraid of. They, They're they so can, strong. They can, they can danger you. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, you take a magnet, you go to put them together and go, and they go clunk, right? Mm -hmm. But you take one of them, move it around, and all of a sudden it doesn't want to yeah, go right. together. Yeah, right. The repulsive. So I got, a, I had, I ordered one at five thousand dollars a piece, wow. with 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 a quarter inch hole through between both of them. And I put a brass bolt and I tighten them down, forcing them together. Mm -hmm. And then I put them together in a thing that looks kind of like a rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I got another one that didn't have magnets in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Galileo, in, in all his endeavors, he went up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And dropped the... And he dropped a big rock and a small rock. Mm -hmm. And his buddy down the bottom kept telling him that the large rock, rock and a small rock arrived at the same time. Well, I went up to in, in the Lockheed Building 501 mm -hmm. by the side of escalators and, and elevators. Oh, wow. And I got, I got, uh, I got, I got uh, nine guys that were not educated and didn't have pre, <laughs> didn't have uh, pre-opinions on anything. Mm -hmm. And I dropped my two rocks. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, what I would like you to do is, I told him what I would like you to do is I would like you to take whichever one arrives first, get it in your hand, and when I come down the elevator, hand it to me. Mm -hmm. Now, they looked identical, except for... So, uh, and nobody knew it was inside? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. All the nine times that I tested it, it's as though the one with the opposing magnet field extending out mm -hmm. three feet on each side I actually measured how, how far, big the field is. How big the field was, and on each side of a rock, the, of one rock, I had a total of six feet. At any rate, the other the other rock arrived first. Which one arrived first? The, the, one, the one that had no magnetic field in it. So you were able to cancel out gravity to a certain degree. You were you able like to that? cancel precisely reduce the mass gravity effect precisely by okay. by opposing fields. Isn't that nice? You you bet and got. Nine signatures and what? I always skip. You, know, you I, did that at Lockheed. What well, year was this? Oh, uh, at least eight years ago. This is um, the actual document of Boyd's, where he proved that by altering the the field in a falling body, the magnetic field, it reduced its mass gravity equivalent and canceled out the uh, effects of gravity to a certain percentage. And he did a five hundred. A building 500 drop test conducted from a height of 59 feet. Mm -hmm. The location is in White Settlement, Texas, and the time was 12:20 p.m. And this was in 1995, December 12th. Nobody yeah. knows this. I know it. But so gravity, mass gravity, is not. Um, well, it, you can alter it. In well, other gravity, words. gravity within itself has to have. Gravity goes through anything that is solid and anything like iron or anything mm -hmm. else. But I, but it has to have a magnetic component, mm -hmm. which may be canceling out within itself. Mm -hmm. But as soon as it got around my rock, it all of a sudden recognized the presence. But somebody, of my rock. I, one of Einstein's students tried to merge electromagnetism and gravity, and mm -hmm. he rejected it. But he didn't have an experiment like you. No, did. I understand. I, yeah. I, I know that. Yeah. But, but but see, we you, nature never uses English. It doesn't speak. It doesn't speak any language. But yet it's talking to us all the time. Right. And the key thing is, is to identify, identify what it's saying. With the meager information that has been accumulated over a period of years, astronomers cannot draw too many definite conclusions about Mars. We realize there are probably certain unavoidable errors in our calculations any one of which could make a big difference as to whether or not there is life as we know it on Mars. For the past half century, the intriguing possibility of traveling to Mars in a spaceship 
has challenged the imagination of many men. Rocket ships of all sizes and shapes have been designed, but most of them rely on an enormous consumption of chemical fuel to escape the pull of the Earth's gravity. A spaceship using an electromagnetic drive to neutralize gravity is the obvious answer. But such a device is still a dream for the future. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave and electric. But basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. Deanne this with United Press International. Could you please address uh, the vehicle that uh, there was a drawing uh, displayed of? Why would this vehicle be on display at an air show? What is the power source that you are asserting is going to be uh, so very useful? And um, how can you determine that this vehicle is not something um, that is being developed, you know, by a government agency? Uh, in fact, I think that was the testimony. This is an alien reproduction vehicle, and just to be clear, uh, this means that it is uh, based on advanced anti-gravity and zero-point energy propulsion systems. They are being manufactured by a consortium of companies that include Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop, uh, SAIC, and other corporations. But this is not a jet internal combustion system at all. It is actually kicked in by a type of electric power source, and it then accesses this ambient zero-point energy field that is uh, responsible for all matter and energy existing and uh, by special configurations and, and what have you, it causes a, a, a cancellation of mass inertia and an anti-gravity effect. The white background represents the dark energy field. The pulsing represents the electromagnetic distortion around all matter, like two atoms. The electromagnetic distortion pushes dark energy away from matter on a gradient and makes all matter appear to have an attraction towards itself. Gravity can be defined as the electromagnetic force that matter exerts on the universe on dark energy that causes a dark energy field effect, or gravity. Gravity can be defined as the electromagnetic force that matter exerts on the universe on dark energy that causes a dark energy field effect, or gravity. Gravity can be defined as the electromagnetic force that matter exerts on the universe on dark energy that causes a dark energy field effect, or gravity. Gravity can be defined as the electromagnetic force that matter exerts on the universe on dark energy that causes a dark energy field effect, or gravity. You can scale this up from atoms all the way to planets and suns and even black holes. Anything that creates gravity is actually not pulling things into itself like a gravity well, more. It is pushing dark energy away, and in doing so, dark energy is pushing harder on the side with the least distortion. As the fields touch each other, it creates a path of least resistance, and the two objects are forced together by the stronger dark energy field on the side with less distortion, giving matter an attraction towards itself. It's dark energy that causes an attraction of matter towards itself that creates gravity. Modern science current science right now identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research it asked for or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale on subatomic particles holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most familiar with uh, holding planets in orbit, holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. 
Gravity bends space. Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space, it bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things are, in theories, we know them to be true. They had an easel next to it with a drawing, a cutaway drawing, that, uh, that showed some of the internal components, how they were arranged with the oriented to one another. And then they had a little uh, a TV monitor with uh, you know, a, a tape player below it that was showing this you know, continuous loop of this thing um, you know, sitting you know, or hovering over a, like a dry lake bed out in the desert somewhere. And, and as, as you would watch the tape, this thing would make, uh, from, went from a hovering position, made these three little sort of hops going to the side. And then as the camera followed it, it just went straight up. It disappeared out of sight. He was down to nothing in just a matter of a second and a half or so. One of the things that this general had said during the presentation, one of the things that really stood out in Brad's mind was that he said that these vehicles were capable of light speed or better. So according to his account, on November 12th, 1988, Mark's friend inadvertently gained access to a highly classified air show where the featured hardware of the event was real flying saucers. They were really strange looking, but appeared functional and were named to suggest anti-gravity and reverse engineered alien technology. An official presence stated they could travel faster than light. Despite their futuristic performance capabilities, these appeared to be stripped down, road-worn working prototypes, which had seen practical operation for years. If this were the case, they were crude but tangible proof of concept for a staggering leap in aviation technology. They used extremely advanced electromagnetic or field propulsion to solid or jet fuel, nuclear power, or any other commonly known conventional means. It also meant our government and at least one other major defense contractor, Lockheed Martin, had been developing and deploying functional systems along these lines for many years. And he just sat down and right where we were sitting there at his table, he just kind of sketched out in a, in a, with, a, with an ink pen on a piece of uh, legal size white paper and put some, you know, some little handwritten call outs around the edges that described, you know, the, the number of capacitor plates in each one of the little sections that there were, you know, they were so wide at the end and the crew compartment was definitely about 12 feet in diameter. Just kind of put all these things down as close as he could remember to the way they existed. This was called the flux liner. This is probably the strangest one you've shown me yet. This actually flies? It actually flies on the principles of high voltage electrical charges. Alicia Davidson described being escorted into the engine room and seeing the propulsion system components. And it involved a central column that was made of a transparent glass-like material. And she said there was a silvery fluid that was spiraling upward in this, in the, at the bottom of this column. Down in kind of this well that was in the center of the spacecraft was this little tiny flywheel-like mechanism spinning, which matched the ARB also. And this is at a point when this young lady had never seen any of the drawings that I'd done of what the ARB was structured like. I was just you know, talking about propulsion components in general. But then she said that when you looked across this little uh, well, in this lower floor area in the center of the room was like a guardrail around it. She stood there. So you could look across, and she said it looked like that below the deck she was standing on was this glass-like material with these coils of wire going through it. And they were spaced out in the same proportions as the ones on the ARB. The thing that she said that was most significant was that the column itself was rotating in one direction, and the flywheel was off, spinning in the opposite direction. It was counter-rotation which is something that's often been reported in UFO sightings. You see components on the craft that are spinning in opposite direction. Back here on Earth, the scientific community has been busy since the end of the Industrial Revolution. There have been dozens, perhaps hundreds of US and international patents dealing directly with electrokinetics and electrogravitics going back to the turn of the last century. It would be safe to assume private industry and the military have also been working on a great deal of related applications off the public record. In short, 
Since Nikola Tesla's first experiments with pushing electricity around, mankind has had a thing for anti-gravity.